Like any good thriller, we have a tale of joy, sadness, and near tragedy, with a twist at the end. It's set in England and stars two Frenchmen and a Scot and has a cast of hundreds. Welcome to our review of the season of the FA Barclay Card Premiership. thought it was going to be Sir Alex Ferguson's last season as manager of Manchester United, but a mid-term change of mind saw him determined to win his eighth Premiership trophy in ten years. Well, determination is a part of me, I suppose, and you know, people will recognise that in me. I don't anticipate uh, not giving my very, very best. It's a big season for me, and I think my players will be right up for it. During the summer, Ferguson spent £47 million on two players, Ruud van Nistelrooy and Juan Sebastian Veron. He also sold Yap Stam for 16 million and replaced him with Laurent Blanc. The United faithful always expect amazing feats from their players, but after only three wins from their first six league games, a few cracks were beginning to show. However, a trip to White Hart Lane in September provided a reminder that the impossible is always possible for the boys in red. And it's a debut goal for Dean Richards. It's a goal! Les Ferdinand has drilled it in. Three nil. Christian Seeger unmarked. Gary Neville, three to aim for. And uh, one of them, Andrew Cole. Blanc! They've got another one, Buck. To involved in these games is uh, is something special and you know we knew that once we got a first goal you know that, that we could build on that and and hopefully get second third fourth and fifth so you know you don't think of these things at the time but you know uh, if you can get that first goal then you can carry on from there I just felt that you know they needed to play with more belief and remember who they are but then the problem set in. The next eight league games saw them win two, draw one and lose five to, amongst others, their main rivals Liverpool, Arsenal and Chelsea. By mid-December, they dropped to ninth in the Premiership. No team had ever lost six times before Christmas in a 38-game season and still won the title. And Ferguson knew full well what that meant. It means we can't afford to lose a game right at the end of the season. And uh, it's, it's a heck of an order, but he's going to require top class football now. Bolton Wanderers, under the stewardship of Sam Allardyce, had been promoted via the playoffs and were, of course, everyone's favourites to go straight back down. Their chances of survival were quickly reassessed on the first day of the season. Michael Ricketts, a £250,000 buy from Walsall, scored four goals in his first nine league matches, including this one in a home win against Liverpool. 
Goals which ensured Bolton remained in the top six until the end of September, a position that came as a complete surprise to the manager. Yes, we're surprised ourselves. Um, I think uh, you know I'm just surprised at the at the um, the level of performance that we've sustained. I know we could it reached that level. I perhaps thought that uh, we may have uh, actually dipped a little bit, certainly with the the amount of efforts that's needed to get to the level we are now. But uh, uh, the players have responded magnificently. Draws away at Elland Road and Highbury were the biggest surprises of the fledgling season, but nothing compared to what happened on October the 20th when they secured a 2-1 win at Old Trafford. Kevin Nolan and Michael Ricketts were the scorers. Sadly, the smallest squad in the league couldn't sustain the momentum, and by Christmas they dropped into the bottom half of the table. But that early season form probably ensured their survival. With four qualifying places available for the Champions League, Leeds United's fans expected their team to comfortably book a place in Europe's premier competition. David O'Leary's side started the season in championship form, travelling to Highbury to beat Arsenal 2-1 in August. Ian Hart put them in front, and although Sylvain Viltord equalised, the Yorkshire side held firm. And they made a lot of people sit up and take notice when Mark Viduka lashed home the winner. There was a downside, though. Ian Hart and Danny Mills were both sent off. A taste of things to come. Undefeated in their first 11 matches, Leeds topped the table until mid-November, but their season began to unravel around Christmas, when at home to Newcastle they led 3-1, only to lose 4-3, that after throwing away a two-goal lead at home to Leicester the week before. After Christmas, the club became embroiled in the trial of Lee Bowyer and Jonathan Woodgate, who'd been charged with assault. Off-the-field distractions had a damaging effect on the pitch. Leeds slipped out of the top five and had to settle for a UEFA Cup spot. Not quite what the manager had in mind back in August. I think when at the start of the season, uh, we played all the top teams. We played Arsenal, but we had our top side out. We went to Liverpool, should have beaten them, but we only drew, had a top side out. I think on too many occasions since then, when we've gone in against the top sides, they've had the full sides out, we haven't. And uh, when you play the big sides, you need your top side out against them if you're going to do well. And uh, that's what we haven't been able to do this season. After the 5-0 hammering by Bolton, Peter Taylor's Leicester City won once in the next six. And by the end of September, he knew that his job was on the line. A 2-0 defeat by Charlton left Leicester rock bottom and Taylor was sacked, the first of seven managerial changes in the season. But the writing had been on the wall almost from the very start. That is my biggest argument with Leicester. You know, I was sacked after eight games but had pressure after two. You know, I was told really after the second game that it, that, that could be my third game, which was Ipswich at home, could be my last game. Dave Bassett replaced Taylor, but not even experience can guarantee job security. As Jim Smith found out, after six years at Derby and seemingly secure to the end of his contract, a run of six games without a win saw him dismissed and replaced by Colin Todd. After 30 years in the game, Smith knew that his dismissal wasn't personal. The pressure now on a Premier League manager is, is, is actually uh, at, at its greatest level because the finances, obviously, that are coming in through uh, Premiership football and going out by Premiership wages, it makes life very difficult. Appointed in the summer, Southampton's Stuart Gray was the third manager to find out that the Premiership axe is wielded indiscriminately. I was very disappointed the way I was treated at Southampton to have only given eight games. Um, people say uh, eight games was probably not enough to prove ourselves. We had a difficult start, but the chairman made that decision, and, um, but that's history now. The cost of a chic new stadium meant that Southampton simply couldn't afford to be relegated, but after 103 years at the Dell, adjusting to life at the St Mary's Stadium was proving difficult. In fact, the team lost their first three home games and amassed only six points from the first 24 available. But former Coventry City manager Gordon Strachan was happy to accept the challenge of keeping them in the top flight. 29,000 supporters, financially OK, uh, potential to do well. Got a catchment area. It's good for the fans. 
Strachan's debut was at home to another of the strugglers, Ipswich Town, and it turned out to be a thriller. That three-all draw was followed by three defeats, leaving the team rock bottom. But then performances improved. Against Charlton, Marion Bahar secured a first home win at St Mary's. Five more wins followed in the next eight games. And Premiership survival was assured with almost indecent haste, leaving the chairman delighted with his new manager. He settled in very well. Uh, I very much enjoy working with him. He's um, very enthusiastic. He's uh, very professional in the way he approaches everything. I think uh, he's improved the players' fitness and also I think they all know now exactly what's expected of them. Surviving the managerial sackings was Glenn Roder, who succeeded Harry Redknapp at West Ham United. It's a great honour for me to have been asked to uh, manage a club with the traditions that West Ham have got and uh, I'm looking forward to it and uh, hopefully we'll have a good season and uh, turn the corner from what was a disappointing year last year. Fans and players alike were hoping for a more high-profile appointment, but as candidates fell by the wayside, the club appointed within. The majority of players applauded the choice. I think a lot of lads did put his name forward, knowing that, you know, we'd be happy to work for him. He's a gentleman. Uh, it's a good atmosphere up here. You know, we all want to play for the club and, um, you know, I think Glenn's going to do a good job. But the season got off to a shaky start. Five points from his first six games put Rhoda under immense pressure. The away form was the most concerning. At the start of October, the Hammers were defeated 5-0 by Everton and then 7-1 by Blackburn Rovers. They conceded 16 goals and scored only five leaving them second from bottom in the league. Rhoda was bringing in a new philosophy and it had the fans divided on whether he should stay or go. Not playing at all well, actually. I, I think it's, it's uh, quite a poor performance, mainly on the part of the manager. I would say I don't know a lot about the man, but you've got to give him a fair crack of the whip. You know, it's only been a few games. I'd like to see anybody given a chance. The results came instantly. Rhoda won the next three games, and with the help of young starlet Jermaine Defoe, West Ham climbed out of the relegation zone. By the time they recorded that famous 1-0 win at Manchester United in December, the Hammers were on their way to a top-10 finish. Premiership. It, it, you've got these great sides, these great players, and that's why we're in there. You know, That's why we want to be there competing against them, so uh, we're looking forward to it. Before their trip to Highbury at the start of November, Charlton were also struggling in the bottom half of the table after only two wins in their first ten games. But they have a habit of succeeding in London derbies. Trailing 1-0, they scored four goals in 18 minutes to memorably beat Arsenal 4-2. Next up was the visit of their closest neighbours, West Ham, for a game that didn't disappoint either. Kipson has scored! From De Yule here, and he's got it in at the second attempt. And here's Ewell again! Charlton are in front. Kipson's well placed, and he's got his second. There's an excellent through ball for Johansson! There's a lovely ball in, and Kitson very close, and again, he's there, he's made it, he's got his hat-trick! And it drops to Defoe, he's done it! It's 4-4! A win and a draw and eight goals scored, it looked as though Charlton's season had finally sprung to life, but injuries would haunt Alan Kirbishley and at times his small squad was stretched to the limit. I've heard other people complain about the injuries, but I don't think anyone's had anything like us. And it's just incredible. And we played um, 
at Newcastle at home. Drew one all and was about to play Chelsea on the Wednesday. And I had 14 fit players. That is all I had left. By the end of January, Charlton had climbed to eighth. But with only two wins in their final 12 games, they had to settle for 13th. Still not bad for one of these supposed minnows. After the high of beating Manchester United on the 1st of December, Chelsea, in typical fashion, lost 1-0 at home to Charlton Athletic. For every good win, there was that unexplained lapse of concentration. It was only Claudio Ranieri's second defeat of the season, but the first 14 league games had produced eight draws against opposition they should have beaten. Despite this, the goals were flowing and an important partnership was taking shape. Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank had already reached 11 goals in the league, once again making him a candidate for top scorer of the season. He scored his 12th against Liverpool, but also on the score sheet that day was Ida Gudjonsson, who knocked up his third of the season, which would begin a run that would see him score eight in seven league games and alongside Hasselbank score an amazing 18 goals in nine league matches between December and January. I'm delighted, but not, I'm, I mean, I want to do even better. I want to, I want to keep progressing and I want to you know, always improve myself. So if I, if I get you know, 20 goals this season, I'd like to score 20-odd next season. Stalled between fifth and sixth place in the league, Chelsea went on a cup run that would take them to the final for the third time in six years before losing to Arsenal. But it guaranteed UEFA Cup football once again. And with Ranieri signing for a further five years, Chelsea had the potential to challenge for the top honours next year. How many times, though, have we heard that before? Arsenal supporters were desperate for success after another second-place finish and cup final heartache. So too was Arsene Wenger. He only spent £18.5 million in the summer, but felt he had a squad that would match Manchester United's and Liverpool's. Their away form had been a weakness last season, but on the first day of the new campaign, they travelled to Middlesbrough and won convincingly, a sign that the team was determined to get it right from the start, a determination that was to produce record-breaking results. Home form was a concern of Wenger's tenure. The visitors made full use of their numerical superiority. Thierry Henry's petulant outburst at the final whistle earned him a three-game ban. Would a lack of discipline prove to be their Achilles heel? Five days later, they went to Anfield and were again reduced to ten men. But the players then showed just how determined they were to achieve something. Oh, and Jungberg's in here! And that must be a penalty, surely! And it's Henry who puts it away! again, easily goes past Gerrard, cuts it back and it's 2-0, Freddie Youngberg! It was a turning point because we just lost against Newcastle and uh, when we won the Danfield with 10 men, uh, every time we were back to the wall we found the resources to win the games and uh, from Anfield on I was convinced that we would win the championship. A special mention for Player of the Year Robert Pires, who badly injured his knee the week after scoring this outstanding goal against Aston Villa and was cruelly ruled out of the running. At the start of their third season back in the Premiership, Sunderland were looking to progress. Two top seven finishes had ignited hopes of Europe and even the Champions League. For Peter Reid, though, things weren't going according to plan. His side were finding consistency difficult, winning only five of their first 17 games. But during the Christmas period, they defeated Everton and then Blackburn 3-0 on Boxing Day to climb to 12th in the table. But they then recorded only two victories in their next 11 games. Missed chances sucked them into the relegation battle. <laughs> 
Stressful times indeed for the manager. I just don't think we, we've been as, as fluent and as played as well. But certainly we haven't stuck our chances away like we did in the, in the previous two seasons. That, I think that's been a major factor. You know, I think defensively we've been not bad, but we ain't scored enough goals. Claudio Reyna, the American World Cup star, was brought in from Glasgow Rangers to bolster the midfield. He had an immediate effect, but it wasn't to last, and Sunderland would become involved in a relegation dogfight. Started off, I scored on my debut at home, which was good. Uh, kind of lifts a little bit of pressure off, and, and the team won, which is the most important thing. <laughs> Unfortunately, right now we're just in a little bit of a battle, but uh, everyone's really confident that we're going to get out of that. Confident, maybe, but it was a battle that would go to the last day of the season. At 69 years of age, Bobby Robson should be able to look back on a successful career as both player and manager from the comfort of his armchair. But such is the passion of the man for his beloved Newcastle that he's intent on bringing success to the region. This season, he went a long way towards achieving those goals. Against Manchester United, he masterminded a 4-3 win. Robert rams it past Bartes. Oh, it bounced through Bartes. It's a goal. It stabs us. He's experienced enough to know how to handle uh, every single situation and that's, I think, it's the most important thing in football, to know how to handle situations when it comes to difficult times. Mikos Dabitas scored the goal that gave Robson his first ever win at the Stadium of Light, a victory that proved they were ready to challenge for the Champions League. You know, we have this terrific enthusiasm, we have great uh, high energy levels and we have wonderful team morale and team, team spirit. It's it's part of the business. Without that, you haven't got a football club. And, of course, he's resurrected Alan Shearer's career, so much so that the striker was able to celebrate his 200th Premiership goal. And strikes number 201 and 202 in the next game against Blackburn secured their Champions League place. Who said football was a young man's game? This programme is sponsored by Bet365. Steve McLaren took up the reins at Middlesbrough, having turned down West Ham in the summer. He inherited a huge squad, short on confidence, having just survived relegation. Colin Cooper scored their first goal after four games, but a fourth successive defeat left them rock bottom with a goals tally of one scored, 11 conceded. We had a bad start and then we, we had a run of, I think, 11 games and we collected 19 points and established ourselves just above, uh, just above the relegation. And, and we had opportunities to really get out of it and go into mid-table, but we didn't take them. Bottom at the end of the year, Middlesbrough lost just twice in January and February, conceding only six goals and lifting themselves to 11th place. An FA Cup round to the semi-final further enhanced reputation of team and manager. Although McLaren believes there's plenty of work still to be done. We're finishing mid-table, probably just below, and uh, we've got to be satisfied with that in the first season. Um, so the full-term report is OK, uh, can do better must do better. No team bottom of the league at Christmas has ever avoided relegation from the Premiership. That was the stark reality facing George Burley as his Ipswich side floundered, taking only 12 points from 17 games. After last season's heroic fifth place, playing Premiership and European football took its toll on a small squad. The fans realised relegation was a real possibility. I mean, if you play badly and actually expect the crowd uh, not to be happy, but um, overall they have been fantastic. But um, saying that, uh, they, they've got to get behind the team for the rest of the season. Um, you know, it's a tough league and we've got no right to stay in the Premiership. 
Three wins over Christmas took them to the edge of the relegation zone, and in January they went on another three-game run, which lifted them to the giddy heights of 12th. Suddenly, survival appeared to be comfortably within their grasp. But it was a false dawn. In February and March, their defences came crashing down again as they won only once in 12. A 6-0 hammering at Portman Road by Liverpool set the alarm bells ringing once more. Like Sunderland, their fate wouldn't be decided until the final day of the season. We are still very optimistic that uh, we can you know, survive in the Premiership. Um, I think the second year was always going to be tough for us after an incredible way we played last season. But everybody's um, confident uh, we, we can uh, survive again this year. Liverpool's expectations were higher than most this season, but even after five trophies in six months, it was the Premiership that was foremost in their plans. Gerard Ullier's side were hot favourites to seriously challenge Manchester United for the title. First six fixtures, but their home clash with Leeds would have a devastating effect on the team and football in general. During the match, Ullier was taken to hospital complaining of chest pains. He was forced to undergo a nine-hour operation and would be away from the game for five months. Assistant manager Phil Thompson took charge of the team. At their next home match, they took on the champions, and the cop made an affectionate tribute to their manager. The team caught the mood perfectly. It's Michael Owen! Oh, what a finish! Risa! What a fantastic goal from John Arne Risa! For the danger, Owen has made it 3-1! Two for Michael Owen! That victory took them towards the top of the table, where they would stay for five weeks, helping Houllier's recovery. He's getting better all the time, and he wants to know a little bit more all the time, and that's what will help. If it helps him, well, we'll, we'll feed things in as it comes. But he's, he, he has, he's made a dramatic recovery, but we have to be careful. Manchester United must inspire Liverpool because after a run of one win in eight, they went to Old Trafford needing something to restart their title challenge. For the second year running, Danny Murphy provided the winner. That victory and a 4-0 away win against Leeds United inspired Liverpool onto a run of six wins in the next seven to put them right in the thick of the title challenge. After last year's promotion, the Premiership drums at Ewood Park have been beating loudly all season but not always for the right reasons. A successful season for Graham Souness would depend on the performances of some of his young stars. Could, for example, David Dunn and Damien Duff adapt to the pressures of top-flight football? I think the biggest thing they've maybe had to come to terms with is that there's no easy games, that there's no, there's no easy games and there's no sustained periods in a game where it's easy. You can take your foot off the accelerator and, and allow your brain to drift off somewhere else. You've got to stay fully focused for the 90 minutes at this level. They were certainly focused during their emphatic 7-1 win against West Ham, but Rovers failed to capitalise on that victory. They remained wildly inconsistent in the league, saving their best for cup competitions. Success in the Worthington Cup final against Spurs in February masked a dreadful league run, which saw them lose 10 times in 12 outings. But with European football guaranteed thanks to their cup exploits, they remained philosophical about their league form. Whenever you're a team coming up from the first division, you're going to go through some growing pains. Uh, we went through it in, during the Christmas period. Uh, Bolton started going through it about that time as well. It's just one of the uh, one of the things that happens. Cup success eventually inspired them in the Premiership, and the Dun Duff combination continued to shine through March and April as they won five times in nine games to secure their league status. By Christmas of his first full season in charge, Glenn Hoddle had started to give the White Hart Lane faithful what they'd always wanted, success. This meeting against Bolton Wanderers at the start of December was to be the first of four times they met in League and Cup. Spurs won them all. This 3-2 victory took them to fifth in the league and challenging for a European spot. It's 
been a season of frustration, one that was highlighted with some great football. Obviously, disappointments in, in getting to the final, not winning it. But I think if we, you know, if, you, if we are going into Europe, we have to be ready to go into Europe. And um, you know, it might be just a, a part of the building process that, that's going in, and that does take time. Any any manager, any club will tell you that. Sadly, successful runs in both competitions didn't produce any silverware. And despite finishing in the top ten, there'll be no European football at White Hart Lane next season. I read the other day, it's... Uh the biggest and best season uh, it's ever likely to be this year. There's a lot of excitement coming up, so um, it's a good place to be at the moment. So if you're in it, make sure you stay in it. Aston Villa wasn't the place to be for John Gregory, though. After guiding them to the top of the league in October, Doug Ellis refused to fund the strengthening of the squad and the two parted company. It's rare that a manager leaves a side that's sitting in sixth position and eyeing up a spot in Europe and the fans weren't happy as they organised a pre-match protest march against Ellis's regime. Undeterred, the chairman appointed Graham Taylor as Gregory's successor. He'd initially left the club in 1990 to become England manager and had retired from football at Watford last season. But a return to premiership management was too great a chance to miss. There are opportunities that some people don't even see. And I think this is an opportunity that is there for me to see, there for everybody to see, and I would, be, I would be sorry with myself if I didn't take it. Taylor received the hero's return, but he used the rest of the season to look at the players available to him. And with just two wins in 14 games, Villa finished eighth, qualifying for nothing grander than the Intertoto Cup. Strangely, John Gregory agreed to replace Colin Todd at Derby County, who were in 19th position and in deep relegation trouble, but he believed he could get them out of it. And against Tottenham, he oversaw an emotional victory. Derby won two of the next five. They then faced the champions at Pride Park, where they were unlucky not to make it three wins out of six. Malcolm Christie put Derby in front. He brought them level at two all. Only to have a winner harshly disallowed, but at that point the fans still believe Gregory would lead them to safety. I think he's done a brilliant job so far, he's uh, transformed the team, he's uh, improved the system, they're playing with a lot of confidence. I've got hope for the future now, which I didn't have before. But Derby went back to losing ways, making things extremely difficult over the last weeks of the season. But in typical fashion, Gregory continued to exude positive thoughts. We're running short of games, so uh, we are still confident. Um, you know, in current form, I think before today's game we were fifth. Uh, the last six matches, so it would uh, suggest that you know we have been heading in the right direction. But um, I mean, we know that we've got an uphill task, but it's uh, it's still a challenge that we feel we're capable of uh, of succeeding in. Everton kicked off their season with two wins and a draw to go top of the league, but in the next 22 games, they'd won a further three times, and Walter Smith was sacked. In three and a half years, he'd managed with little funds to keep Everton in the Premier League. By March, after four losses in five and an FA Cup defeat, the board felt his luck and time had run out. 36 hours later, David Moyes was the new manager, and it didn't take the former Preston North End boss long to impress the fans. Cheers. Welcome. Nothing. I'm joining a football club which uh, is probably the people's football club in Liverpool. And uh, the people in the street support Everton. And... Uh, I hope to give them something over the next few years that they can be very proud of. In fact, he gave them something within 60 seconds of his very first game at home to Fulham. After a standing ovation for the new man at the helm, David Unsworth wasted no time in signalling the dawn of a bright new era.
Duncan Ferguson sealed the 2-1 win. And in their very next game, they won again 4-3 at Derby, leaving the Everton fans delighted with their new leader. I just think he's put a you know, bit of regeneration into the, the whole mood of the place. Uh, everybody was a bit down in the dumps with the way Everton were playing under Smith, too defensive. And I think uh, you know, he's just brought a fresh attitude, more attack and play, and that's what they're expecting. <laughs> Two further wins ensured Premier League football once again for Evertonians next season, with their team finishing 15th. <laughs> Amidst the tranquility of their Riverside setting, last season's runaway Division One champions had a wildly fluctuating season. Fulham returned to the top flight after an absence of 33 years. Jean Tigana's side made an elegant start to Premiership life, playing the kind of attractive football that's synonymous with their stylish manager. Mid-table by Christmas was a fair achievement, and the new year brought hopes of Europe. But then things ground to a halt. They found themselves stuck on 35 points, losing six consecutive matches, and now there was a fear of the drop. Defender Rufus Brevet was realistic about the situation. I don't think we're playing with as much confidence as we have at uh, the beginning of the season. And I think that always happens when you, when you lose games. You do tend to lose that little bit of confidence. You need to get that win, and, and I think that will breed the confidence and get it all back, because you don't turn into a bad team overnight. Well, Fulham certainly weren't a bad team in the FA Cup. They reached the semis, only to lose out to their London neighbours, Chelsea. But the Premiership pressure was on Tigana. Three more games without a win dragged them towards the relegation zone. But he still received the full support of his chairman, despite the fact that the club reported a £23 million loss. League status was secured against Bolton Wanderers after an impressive away win at Leeds United the week before. It had been a tough first season for Fulham, but they have qualified for the Intertoto Cup. It won't, though, be at Craven Cottage next year. They're moving to Queen's Park Rangers, Loftus Road. After 103 years, the ground is to be rebuilt. So by the morning of March the 23rd, Manchester United were top, two points ahead of Arsenal and Liverpool, but the Gunners had a game in hand. It was to be a compelling race right to the end of the season. United were the first to slip up when Middlesbrough visited Old Trafford. The fans gave Steve McLaren a warm welcome back to the club he'd left in the summer, but would his team rob them of their silverware? In the ninth minute, the wrong court dwelling on it. Boxic has hit another devastating blow for Manchester United and Sir Alec Ferguson. The players have shown great character over the years. The club has always made with rise to challenges. We're now a big one. And we need Arsenal and Liverpool to slip up now. March the 24th saw the return of Gerard Houllier to league action. He'd inspired his team to European triumph in midweek, and now he hoped to do it in the league. Chelsea were the opponents, Liverpool left it to the very last minute. Here come Liverpool again, Lippmannen to Heskey. Might not get very many more opportunities, Heskey does well. Pulls it right back in and a goal! It's Vladimir Spitzer! What a finish for Liverpool! A goal to project them to the top of the Premiership! It's the Julia effect again! Easter Saturday and Manchester United had the chance to go top by beating Leeds in an early kickoff, and they didn't wilt on a day of glorious sunshine at Elland Road. And the finish is by Scholes, and it's Viduka in here, and Leeds are level. Now it's Scholes can really hit them like that. Solskjaer makes it 2-1. Here is Silvestra. Giggs could go and there's Solskjaer again. Oh, it's three. Beckham. Here's a United counter. Beckham powering away down the right hand side as Giggs and Solskjaer waiting in the middle. Here comes the cross, it's Giggs and it's 4 1. What about that? 
that. Robbie Keane takes on Ronnie Johnson. Good run, great chance, and Leeds United are back in reach. Our supporters and players and managers would probably expect us to maybe drop something today, but it's not an easy place to come to. Man United's victory meant that Arsenal knew they had to beat Sunderland to stay in touch. Their FA Cup run had prevented them from playing the week before, giving them two games in hand over their rivals. Still favourites, but they had to win. Patrick Vieira, Dennis Bergkamp and Sylvain Viltord secured a 3-0 victory and Wenger knew they were in pole position. It's uh, down to us and to how well we play and we feel uh, we have, we have the needed strengths. It meant Liverpool had to keep on winning. Murphy's kick, Schmitzer! He's done it again! And Elper has bent his run to stay onside, he's got Owen in the middle. Support arriving too from Schmitzer. Vladimir Schmitzer, Owen! 2-0 Liverpool and on course for a return to the top of the table. At the Valley on Easter Monday, Arsenal had the chance to go top by beating Charlton Athletic. Oh, and Henri. Roof is trying to get there, but Henri makes the most of it. Henri. Bergkamp, no flag. Round the goalkeeper. Freddy Jungberg. Arsenal lead by two goals to nil. Here's Jungberg and Will talk. He's got Henri with him. He looks for Henri, Henri scores, it is 3-0 to Arsenal. So Arsenal took the lead a point ahead of Liverpool, two ahead of Man United. Crucially, they still had another game in hand. At Filbert Street, another early kickoff meant Manchester United could resume the lead by beating Leicester City. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer scored the goal that sent them top. It also confirmed relegation for the Foxes, whose disappointed manager Dave Bassett then handed over the reins to Mickey Adams. It will sink in on us all in the next few weeks, and uh, it's not the greatest feeling when all of a sudden you realise you've lost something that you wanted to always keep. In North London, it was Derby Day, a real test of character for the players. Bergkamp, Jungberg again, Keller again, but it rolls on in. Arsenal 1, Tottenham 0. Oh, and Gus Poet. Is he in here? Now David Seaman came out, caught Poet. A penalty to Spurs. Well, this is a crucial decision in the whole Premiership picture at the top of the table. And Sheringham cracks it in for 1 1. Oh, down goes Ulrich, there's another penalty. It's a penalty for Arsenal. Up steps Lauren. Oh, and he's rolled it in. Keller committed himself to the left. Arsenal jubilation. It's turned back their way. We have five games to go, so just let's go to the next game and uh, try to win it again. An early evening kickoff for Liverpool in the North East, where a win would guarantee Champions League football. For He's still very much alive. Well, Arsenal are still uh, in command and they've still won game in hand, but uh, it's not good for my heart at the moment. <laughs> not good either for Peter Reid. Two weeks later, United travelled to Stamford Bridge for the sort of challenge the manager said they enjoy. And a dangerous situation here for Chelsea. Ryan Giggs free kick, fooled everybody, Scholes, oh what a magnificent strike by Paul Scholes, so typical of the man, brilliant goal. Here's Solskjaer, and now Van Nistelrooy, not going to miss that, 2-0 to Manchester United, Ruud Van Nistelrooy's 34th goal of the season. Mr. Roy's got away from his man again. And rolls it into the path of Giggs. Brilliant finish by the little fella, Solskjaer. Giggs so unselfish. He could have scored himself. He didn't. He did. 3-0 to Manchester United. 
At Anfield, Michael Owen received the European Footballer of the Year award before dismantling and relegating Derby County. Owen, looking to get the better of Riggett, and he's got through, Michael Owen! Heskey, and Owen is away and onside, and Oakes has come out to meet him. Michael Owen, goal! Liverpool stay on course for the title, Derby are relegated. You know, I've got to take uh, responsibility for not being able to keep us in the Premiership, you know, it's hard to live with and um, we have to be try and take all the positives out of what's been uh, uh, an appalling season really for our club. Two down and George Burley's Ipswich look favourites to be the third team relegated. Ipswich would play all the leading teams in the run-in beginning at Highbury, where after a tenth 70 minutes, Freddie Lundberg scored a brace to take Arsenal back to the top of the table. Lundberg was to become the man of the end of season running. Lundberg scored again against West Ham and Carnu added a second as Arsenal took full advantage of their game in hand. The title was now theirs to lose. We are in a great position and of course uh, it's just uh, down to us to how well we play the next game. Four points clear with three games left. By now they were just two wins away from the championship. Ironically, it was Tottenham who helped Arsenal lose one of their challenges. With ex-Liverpool player Jamie Redknapp watching, Gus Poyet scored to dent Liverpool's title dream. Now, if Arsenal won their next game, Liverpool could only finish second. I'm disappointed for the players and the fans because we didn't get the result we expected and we wanted. There's six points to at stake and uh, we'll fight uh, to death for that. Three points from safety, Ipswich Town fans wanted to believe that survival was still a possibility, but Manchester United had to win. Ruud van Nistelrooy won a penalty decision, which he took full advantage of. And United duly climbed above Liverpool into second. So it was between United and Arsenal, and at Bolton the Gunners made it all but safe with a 2-0 win. Here come trying to dance his way through you. won the title yet but we believe we will win it and of course we want to finish the job and so to Old Trafford where a draw or better would hand Arsenal the title Arsene Wenger's team had won the FA Cup final the previous weekend and a glorious double was inside Arsenal runners up for the last three seasons are champions this time and Arsene Wenger completes a league and FA Cup double for the second time. A dream come true and incredibly Arsenal had gone the whole season unbeaten away from home. We won 14 games away from home and had five draws and uh, scored in every game for the whole season. That is a tremendous achievement. On the same evening that Arsenal triumphed, Liverpool beat Blackburn Rovers and then won 5-0 against Ipswich to confirm the East Anglian side's relegation. Second spot then for Liverpool, a remarkable achievement after all that had happened. At the end of the day, if you look at uh, what had been achieved this season, I mean, I can't really, I can't describe how remarkable their performance has been, taking into account what happened to me, to Marcus Babel, to some of the players like uh, Nicky Barmby or... Patrick Berger, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's a great and massive achievement. So the title for Arsenal, Liverpool finished above Manchester United for the first time in a decade and they must now pre-qualify for the Champions League. Ipswich, Derby and Leicester face the uncertainty of life in Division 1. Sunderland survive, but will expect rather more next time around.
For Arsenal then, their second double in four years. They scored in every Premiership game and finished with a club record of 13 consecutive wins. There's no doubt they were the team of the season. The standards reached levels never seen before, making the Premiership without doubt the most exciting league in the world. From Marcus Buckland and me, Simon Reid, goodbye. <laughs>